The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for participating in today's Alzheimer's Learning Day and joining us in this webinar. My name is Lakeland Hogan, and I am gerontologist and caregiver advocate for Home Instead Senior Care. And I'll be our facilitator for today's Alzheimer's Learning Day webinar geared specifically to senior care professionals. Alzheimer's Learning Day is brought to you by Home Instead Senior Care, a network of locally owned franchise offices. Home Instead Senior Care's network offers in-home care with an individualized approach to keeping your loved one safe and independent at home. And to learn more, you can visit homeinstead.com. And before we get uh, begin, I just wanted to go over a couple housekeeping items. To start, we have muted all of your lines, so feel free to go about your day if the doorbell rings, if a colleague comes up, if uh, another person's phone rings in the background, we can't hear it on our end. So rest assured that your line is on mute. And then we also are welcoming questions. And don't wait until the very end to type them in. You can type them in at any time. There is a questions box on your screen. However, we will address all questions in the last 10 to 15 minutes of today's webinar. But again, type them in as they pop into your head and we'll get them addressed the best we can uh, at the end of our hour. And then finally, we are recording today's webinar, so you don't have to worry about taking any notes. Uh, we'll send out a recording at the end of today's event, and it'll also be posted online on, uh, on our website for Alzheimer's Learning Day, which I'll share at the very end. So if you like the webinar, want to share it with a colleague, family member, friend, uh, you can feel free to do so. Uh, or back, go back and listen to your favorite part from the webinar. So we have all those housekeeping items out of the way. Um, let's go ahead and get started. While there's no cure yet for Alzheimer's disease and related forms of dementia, there is care. And today we're going to be talking about some practical ways that you can help improve care for your clients or patients with dementia. And I have two experts here with us to share their expertise with you. And so I'm going to kick us off by introducing our two uh, seasoned ex experts here. First, we have Diane uh, Bovenkamp. She's a uh, Vice President of Scientific Affairs, overseeing all of Bright Focus's research programs, and serves as a scientific liaison for the organization in local, national, and international forums, and identifies and develops new research initi initiatives, uh, partnerships, and funding policies consistent with the mission of Bright Focus. And prior to assuming her current position, uh, yeah, she served as the Scientific Programs Officer and Science Communications Specialist at Bright Focus and as a Director of Science Information and Programs at the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Um, she's obtained her PhD in biochemistry from Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada, discovering and studying uh, EPH receptors in angiogenesis genesis and neural development in zebrafish and mice. She's also completed postdoctoral fellowships in the vascular biology program at Boston's Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School, isolating and characterizing zebrafish, zebrafish neuropylins, and uh, Dr. Uh, Bovenkamp has conducted further research at John Hopkins University uh, in the Division of Cardiology at John, John Hopkins School of Medicine in Baltimore, using uh, different techniques for, bi for biomarkers detection in human serum. So she's got lots of great uh, research experience and we'll bring some of that to today's conversation. And then our next expert is Laura Collar. Uh, Laura is a caregiver for Home Instead Senior Care's franchise in North Carolina. She's worked at Home Instead since May of 2016, caring for older adults and supporting their families. Prior to that, she worked in an assisted living facility. She also has some care, family caregiving experience as she helped to care for her dad with dementia for several years before he passed away. In her current role at Home Instead Senior Care, she, re she received training as, um, as part of the CARE program, which is Changing Aging Through Research and Education, and she's passionate about serving clients with dementia, and she will bring uh, a, a unique perspective as well. So, Diane and Laura, thank you both so much for joining us. We are so excited to have you on today's live chat. So welcome. Thank you. It's a pleasure. All right. Well, I know over the course of this hour, we're going to be covering a lot of different topics. Uh, and 
of course, before we open it up for Q&A. And if you're just joining us, uh, please feel free to type in your questions at any time. We're going to wait till the end, but uh, we will get to your questions. So type them in as they come to you. So our first topic fo focuses on dementia diagnosis. A key question that I want to talk about today is uh, the imp revolves around the importance of an early dementia diagnosis and how that can help us communicate with families in their planning and treatment uh, plan or their care plan. So I wanted to start by uh, asking you, Diane, why is it so important that people get an early diagnosis and plan for their future? Can you talk to that a little bit? Absolutely. I think the main thing is that an earlier diagnosis um, means the earlier that, you know, you can coordinate a patient-derived care plan that, that works for them. Um, even though, um, unfortunately, there isn't a, currently, a treatment uh, that, you know, gets at the core uh, prevention of, of, uh, of how Alzheimer's starts. There are some drugs for um, treating some of the symptoms, so you could also have access to that. And it really, um, there actually are really a lot better tools that are out there to diagnose. There's biomarkers, there's brain scans um, that you can, um, that families can can find out, uh, you know, with their doctor, they can, they can uh, make that diagnosis. And really, um, it will help uh, help families to plan for the future, um, you know, looking at financial implications, legal implications. You know, if, if you're not currently living a healthy lifestyle, you could start that. Really, I think that, in you know, when, when there's a diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's or other dementia, you know, there is a lot of stress um, that happens for um, the person involved, for their loved ones, you know, extended network. So, it's really good to increase the support network and know that you're not alone. And I think that for um, for uh, uh, senior care professionals and um, and uh, paid caregivers and, and family caregivers, it's good to have um, a plan in place to know that what you're dealing with to deal with, you know, any symptoms that could come up and also with, you know, other diseases that people could have at the same time that could complicate things like diabetes, high blood pressure. I'll stop That's there. all great. That's all great information. <laughs> and Laura, um, I know when we talk about the planning process and how uh, families can best prepare their loved one, there's definitely some things that we need to consider when it comes to the environment that an individual uh, that has just been diagnosed with Alzheimer's, or maybe they've they've had it for a while and the family's kind of waited to get a diagnosis because they just are maybe in denial. Um, but anyway, they get the diagnosis and then um, they're back at home. Are there some things that they can look out for that can help make their living environment um, or more uh, safe, uh, more um, suited for maybe some of the cognitive declines that they have now or maybe the we can help the families think ahead for maybe some modifications we need to make down the road or other ways to support uh, the family caregivers and the individuals living with Alzheimer's or another dementia. So, Laura, would you mind talking to that a little bit? Uh, well, I guess one of the things that I would think of is um, you need to have a lot of patience um, and give lots of verbal cues. Uh, um, I'll just speak to my dad. Um, I took care of him for about three years. And we, you know, he liked to go in the kitchen, and, you know, in the middle of the night, he'd wake up in the middle of the night, go in the kitchen. Um, and so my mother was always worried about what he was going to do. So we actually took the knobs off the stove, and so he couldn't turn the stove on. Um, we did little things like that, we, you know, so that he couldn't hurt himself or do anything like that. Um, we, she put... Um, alarms on the doors so that if he did go outside she knew that he was outside um, because he did sometimes like to wander um, so that was one thing that she did um, so th those are a couple of things that you know I can relate to with my dad yeah those are some some good suggestions so there's certainly things that we can do around the home to you know um, help them avoid falls or we can, um, you know, help add. What was that? We used a lot of Post-it notes too. 
a lot of <laughs> that's a great suggestion yeah uh, posted notes what about if somebody um if if when talking with families you know a lot of times people are concerned about what if what if my loved one wanders or gets out of the home you mentioned putting certain locks on the doors but are there any other resources that you're aware of that might uh, help families with that um, yeah and I can't I'm, like, I'm drawing a blank to the name right now but home home instead is linked to a resource and maybe you can help me with the name of that late one um, yeah yeah I the missing senior network the missing mm -hmm. senior network that's the one um, that's a really good one. If they wander, um, you know, contact them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, Go ahead, Diane. Diane yep. I think that uh, you know, these days, um, there's a lot of technology that can be that can be great. I mean, there's GPS locators, there's assist technology, especially, you know, I think that um, they say there's a 2011 study that showed that 13% of people with dementia who are living in the community live alone. Um, and so, and their families might not even be in the same town. So I think that um, if you are helping to care for someone like that, you'll want to try and uh, watch out for that. I know with wandering, um, there's other things where um, I've heard of people um, putting actually like a, a poster of like a bookshelf or a window on the back of the door. So it doesn't look like it's a door um, to go out. So there's, there's simple things like that you can do. Oh, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, I've seen that in a lot of care facilities, especially is uh, they'll make the door blend in with the artwork on on the wall. Um, a great, some great suggestion there. And you're right, technology really has come a long way, especially in the caregiving field. There's so many different, um, you know, um, wearable devices that families can purchase or in-home video cameras. And uh, but there's also some just you know, uh, simple safety modifications that you can make in the home. Uh, I know Home Instead has created a make uh, make safe, home safer for seniors uh, dot com site where there's like a whole checklist where it walks you through every room of the house and mm -hmm. talks about um, how we can make the home safer uh, in each mm -hmm. area and also specifically around Alzheimer's uh, and dementia if they have if they have that. Um, diagnosis then some specific things to look out for in terms of home safety so um, when Diane just to talk a little bit more about this early diagnosis you know where should we be directing families I heard uh, that there's a kind of a new um, a Medicare benefit that isn't it that if you're a Medicare recipient when you go to the doctor you can have a cognitive screening have, is that correct, or is that your your general practitioner you should be turning to, or a specialist? Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think that it, it was just introduced recently, and uh, forgive me if I don't get all the details correct, but yes, it's um, kind of built into, uh, CMS is built into the, I think it's the annual visit, where there's a certain code that probably the primary care physician, but um, whoever is, you know, caring for that that person on a regular basis, I believe um, part of the annual visit um, would take, you know, a certain number of minutes just to assess uh, cognitive well-being. So that that was really a big win um, when that went through, because um, that'll help with the early detection, definitely. Wonderful. Yeah, that's a great, great resource for everyone. And uh, it's available to all of us uh, that are or those over the age of 65 and um, something that we can kind of keep tabs on. You know how we, we get checkups on our heart and our eyes and our ears regularly. I think it's important that we think of our brain as an organ that we need to be getting checked on uh, regularly so that if there are some changes, we can catch those early um, because it's really important to plan, which we've talked about earlier. You mentioned uh, there's a lot of uh, financial costs uh, that come along with a dementia diagnosis. You know, adding care uh, towards the uh, mid to late stages is, is important and can be costly. And I've heard from a lot of families that when they get an earlier diagnosis, they're also able to incorporate the uh, individual with the disease into some of that planning and decision making so that they're respecting their wishes and wants too. So that can mm -hmm. certainly be uh, important when it comes to getting an early diagnosis. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about the diagnosis. Um, let's move on to our next topic of improving care for individuals with Alzheimer's disease. So 
what, se what can senior care professionals do to continually improve the care of the people that they work with? Diane, I know um, you have some great information in this realm. Would you mind sharing with us? Yeah, it's really exciting. I think that there's more and more of a push in the research community and the clinical, uh, the medical and clinical care community to try and find, you know, evidence-based, evidence-based improvement in, in lifestyle um, and, and basically to improve quality of life. Um, so, so there actually was a um, report that recently came out from the National Academies of Sciences. And um, there's some lessons, I think, that we can all learn from this and maybe try to incorporate in our practice. So um, the, um, the committee, uh, the panel said that the, um, there, were, there were positive effects of, and I'm gonna list three things um, after this, that are supported by, quote, encouraging but inconclusive evidence. So um, the way that science works is that uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of different scientists will study it, some find you know, uh, results on, on one side or the other, and there's lots of debate, and this is really rigorous. And so at the point, these three things are kind of really close to the tipping point of a lot of the scientists, you know, all signs pointing to yes, that this will um, help to, <clears throat> you know, have a, a lifestyle-based improvement. And uh, so one of them is, uh, and I think the number one for most of the people I talk with, uh, most of the professionals I talk with are increased physical activity. So um, it doesn't necessarily have to be aerobic. It can also be weight resistance. The other is um, blood pressure management for people with hypertension. Um, it's actually some uh, aspects of um, dementia are vascular, and so and, you know if you if you manage your blood pressure, uh, that's probably uh, linked in there. And uh, the third is what they call cognitive training, but it's not necessarily you know commercial games. It's just something that might challenge people. And I think um, so. Those are really encouraging. So. Um, and then the other two things that um, um, people can look for in their quality is to, in, in, uh, for their clients is um, when you're taking care of someone is to make sure like good quality sleep is really important. Um, apparently, um, professionals say that when you sleep at night, it's essentially, you know, unmucking up your brain. It's getting rid of all the junk. Um, <clears throat> um, <laughs> both uh, stress-wise, but also, um, you know, biochemically and, and protein-wise. And if you uh, have a bad quality of sleep, um, this can, you know, lead to increased risk for um, dementia. And, uh, and also, I think the other thing that scientific studies um, have shown, there's actually a study uh, with the religious uh, order study um, done in association with the Rush um, uh, medical uh, institution up in, in Chicago, that um, social interaction is very important for people who have, you know, already been diagnosed with dementia to try and, or, or, and or to help try and um, prevent risk. So I think that if, um, when, when uh, all of the care professionals are trying to coordinate a personalized care plan for an individual, you want to try and incorporate in there that someone has good quality sleep, they're socializing, they have some uh, physical activity, and you know, doing things that, that challenge them. Those are all really great suggestions. Um, I know that we had somebody right in. I, I know I'm not trying to address questions right away, but I guess this is kind of good to just level set. I know um, many professionals out there know about Alzheimer's disease and um, know that it's an aging brain disease and it's a process that is um, affects somebody over the, over a period of time. But Diane, would you mind just giving uh, a brief overview of the different stages uh, or the different phases of Alzheimer's disease um, and just a, a quick tidbit on each um, you know phase of the disease or stage? Would you mind doing that quick? Absolutely, because I think it is really important for um, um, you know, professionals who will be having, you know, sometimes daily contact with individuals, you're at the front line to be able to, you know, notice is there a change, you know, and, and, and maybe this person has, has slipped, you know, gone into the next stage, um, and which, you know, then 
you know, the, there'll have to be a better coordination um, between all the parties involved, social workers and medical and um, other healthcare professionals. So, so yeah, so there's, um, there are many different stages there. Uh, <laughs> you may hear the term prodromal, you may hear um, MCI, there's, um, there's a number of stages where people are kind of in the early stages are very um, fully um, cognizant of everything, um, maybe just a few um, issues with, with memory. And it really can only be at that stage diagnosed by, um, you know, gerontologists or neurologists, um, specialists who would, you know, first give the cognitive tests and then maybe uh, now that there are a number of tests that are available for, um, you know, for, for looking at for brain scans and, and things like that. We could perhaps uh, move forward um, to see whether or not it is Alzheimer's, because the first thing that's important for a medical doctor to do is to make sure that this, uh, any cognitive issues isn't another disease. Um, so sometimes there can be a vitamin B12 deficiency there can be um, a virus, something that will um, make someone seem like they have uh, this condition. But yeah, then then once um, people you know move forward in the disease, there's what they call mild or stage one, moderate stage two, and severe stage three. And there's basically progressive um, loss in uh, you know in in difficulty in, in learning and memory loss. And, you know, in phase one, people, you know, may have a loss of energy and spontaneity, and they can also become very angry and frustrated. In stage two, this is where someone would need a lot of help carrying out anything but simple tasks. They could have problems speaking, writing, reading, dressing, depending on the sections of the brain that are affected. Um, and, uh, and because everyone's a little different, um, and then the third stage would be where someone might not be able to feed themselves or speak or recognize people. So they might, might more be confined to bed. Thank you so much for that overview, Diane. That's very helpful, you know, as we kind of set the stage for the rest of our conversation. And Laura, I know um, when individuals or families come to Home Instead and looking for assistance, a lot of times um, they're needing uh, assistance with their activities of daily living, those types of things. Um, and there's some specific techniques uh, that can really be helpful when working with an individual with Alzheimer's or dementia. Can you talk about um, those different techniques uh, that you use in your uh, daily work as a, as a home and study caregiver? Well, one of the things that I use and, and, and Laura, sorry to interrupt. Could you speak up just a little bit? I know we've had some comments that people are having a little hard time hearing you. Okay. Um, one of the things that I use Thank you. that we all use is um, verbal cues. <clears throat> like, you know, if we're giving them a shower, you know, I always tell them, okay, now I'm going to wash your back. Okay, now I'm going to wash your arms. Um, I think verbal cues are very important because um, they startle. They, you know, they don't fear the unknown. Um, they like to know what's going to happen. Um, so a lot of verbal cues, you know, to me is important. Um, and what else did you want to know? What else was the question? Oh, that's okay. Some additional. I know, like, um, in our care training, we talk about, you know, different techniques, like offering some choices or redirecting those types of things. Would you talk about those or maybe give a couple examples when those have been used successfully? Um, redirection is, is one that I can speak to. Um, I'll, I'll go back to my dad. He, he was very, very obsessed with time. Um, if you told him that you were going to leave at 8 o'clock, you better be ready to walk out the door at 8 o'clock. And if it was 8.01, he would get extremely anxious. Um, so we oftentimes had to redirect him, um, whether it was he loved music. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, if we were going somewhere as a family and my mother wasn't ready, I would start singing with him. And that would totally take his mind off the time. Um, so whatever, you know, you just need to find some other way to get, to take their focus off what they're intent on. Um, so music was a great thing with my dad because he just, he loved music. Um, so that was one way that we could always redirect him was with singing. He loved church hymns, so we would sing church hymns. Um, 
So that that was a good good redirection for him. That's a great example. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways that you can redirect an individual. And I like how you said that your dad used to love music. So that's a great um, tidbit is, you know, use that person's past uh, or the different things they used to like or do when they were younger, because it's those long-term memories that people hold on to the longest in this, in this disease. So if we can draw back to things that they are familiar with, maybe from their, um, their childhood, their 20s, 30s, uh, those that those years of their life that can really be helpful when trying to now help uh, the individual with some of the symptoms that they start to see that that Diane just kind of walked us through in those various stages of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so thank you so much, Laura, for sharing some examples from your your personal caregiving experiences. And I know we have uh, another topic that we wanted to cover. Um, and that's on future research. So I know we talked about how, um, you know, it's important to get a diagnosis and it's important to um, talk about ways that we continually improve the care. Um, so what's coming down the pipeline in terms of research? Let's talk a little bit more about that. We know that there's not a cure, um, but everyone can contribute to research. So uh, whether you have dementia or whether you're a caregiver or maybe you're just a healthy, a, a older adult uh, and you want to participate. So um, Diane, would you speak to what individuals with dementia or anyone that's participating in a clinical trial should know? Uh, and then maybe if you know of any current studies going on or any that you're working on, would you mind just talking a little bit about that? Absolutely. Um, yeah, there have been uh, recently that there have been a number of, you know, spectacular fails with with clinical trials that have been in the public. But, you know, there are, you know, a lot of other really, really exciting and in, encouraging um, treat potential treatments that are in clinical trials right now. Um, at Bright Focus, we fund, you know, research for, you know, the basic research and help trying to feed the pipeline with these new innovative ideas. And sometimes we'll try and, you know, fund um, one of those innovative ideas, you know, in a in a in a clinical trial. And so, um, so yeah, so there there are dozens and dozens of of clinical trials that are out there. Um, we can provide people some more information, um, you know, uh, afterwards in a link into our website. We actually have an information booklet that gives you more information on clinical trials and actually we have like a widget that people could go and actually go and look up um, maybe what clinical trials might be in, in, in their area and you might be, be eligible, bar, uh, eligible for. But yeah, I mean, I think that this is um, the benefits of, you know, of course you should always make, you know, um, the consideration on whether you know, someone or, you know, and, and with in coordination with their family and, and, and in consul consultation with their primary care physician um, on, on whether or not a trial is right for you. But there are lots of benefits. Um, you'd be to enroll in a trial, you'd be helping the cause of research, you know, you may find, you know, a, a treatment better than the one that you're currently on. Um, you know, participation may help people, um, other people uh, who have Alzheimer's too, and it, it may help to accelerate research. Um, so um, there may be, you know, in terms of eligibility, they may have strict limitations. Um, however, if, um, you know, if you're interested, definitely start up this conversation uh, with, with your doctor. And, uh, and you, can, you can actually print out, you know, search, search on places like our website, um, find something and then print it out and bring it to your doctor and, and bring some questions. That's great suggestions, Diane. It is so important because without participants in these clinical trials, there's no way that they can uh, test out whether or not the intervention or the the drug or um, you know whatever they're trying to test can. They need participants to make it happen. So it, it is a an important way that we can all contribute um, to. The research and the advancement in the Alzheimer's space, um, and then Laura, I was gonna, I was gonna say, uh, sometimes when we're working one on one with older, uh, older adults with uh, dementia or Alzheimer's, it can seem like a little bit of a clinical trial because we know that everyone with Alzheimer's is different, and you could try one intervention or one way to assist one day, 
and it might work. And then the next day, the same exact thing might not work. And then three days later, it'll work. So it could kind of almost seem like a clinical trial, trial and error. We see that so often when working with older adults. Um, Laura, when, when you work with your clients, um, can you suggest or comment on how professionals can create a more personalized experience uh, to these different interventions or techniques that fit their unique personality? So when we're trying and maybe finding errors, how can we just make it more personalized in the way we approach the care of an older adult with Alzheimer's or dementia? Well, I think you have to approach everyone personally because like you said, everyone is so different. They may be at different stages. Um, and, you know, everybody reacts to everything differently. So, I mean, it's got to be a personal approach with each and every one of them. Um, so every, every case has to be individualized, um, including, you know, the family, the caregiver, um, the doctors. Um, they're all so different in what they need and, like I say, what stage they're at. So um, it's, it's, they all have to be very individualized. That's a great point. Yeah, taking that individualized approach, and I know in the professional setting, uh, personalized, person-centered care or personalized care is always kind of the hot word uh, or hot button word when we talk about um, Alzheimer's and dementia and developing uh, different care approaches. So thanks so much for sharing that. Um, well, those were the general topics I wanted to cover, but we have lots of great questions coming in. So, Diane and Laura, if it's okay with you, we'll just jump into today's Q&A portion uh, a little bit early because there's so many great questions that we have. So first we have Robert, and Diane, this might be a question for you. Um, Robert asked, have there been any new drugs out besides Aricept and Namenda? Are you aware of any, Diane? Yeah, so really there haven't been um, any new drugs that have come out for a while. Um, there have been, I mean, really the, the drugs that are out there are, you know, um, so I guess that Namenda is what they would call like a glutamate inhibitor. So it kind of, you know, protects the brain cells by, by helping the nerve cells to um, uh, communicate better with each other because because in Alzheimer's, kind of the communication between the brain cells gets all gummed up with uh, proteins called tau protein and, and beta amyloid. And um, it can really, you know, e either stop the cells from communicating with each other. And then, and then you know, if they can't communicate with each other, sometimes the, the nerve cells kind of like shri shrivel up. And, 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 and because they all need to keep um, uh, communicating with each other. And then, and then there's the Aricept, which is the cholinesterase inhibitor. So um, it kind of, you know, juices up um, the the nerve mes messenger called acetylcholine. That's that's important for memory and thinking. So those drugs are great. Um, they've been putting out new drugs, um, you know, within the past little while, more like combination drugs, um, like. Um, uh, Namzeric is is uh, basically a combination of the glutamate inhibitor and the uh, cholinesterase inhibitor. However, you know a lot of the clinical trials for those it works in maybe something like 30% of people who take them and only for six to 12 months. So that's the big disappointment with those. Um, in terms of you know other drugs that are coming down the pipeline, there's you know people are looking at ways to try and stop the um, you know, those, those proteins, the beta amyloid and tau from clumping up and, and causing miscommunication. Um, they try to do that in a number of different ways. Um, there's, um, you know, there's inhibitors to a protein that actually breaks down precursors of the beta amyloid and, um, and tau and, and trying to, to prevent those toxic forms from forming. So, so there's a lot of really exciting, you know, that's only a couple that I'm talking about. There are some in clinical trials, they're in phase one, phase two, and phase three, which basically means that they're getting closer and closer to the market. Thank you so much for that answer. And, and just for those that might not be overly familiar, and 
and I'm kind of asking this for a clarifying question myself too, but when it comes to these types of, of drugs that people might be prescribing or they might see their patients taking, uh, like Aricept and Demenda, uh, these are helping to with those be with those symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. Is that correct? So it's not going to really stop the progression or maybe slow it down. It's just more so helping to to manage those symptoms. Is that right? Absolutely, yeah. And I think that, um, so those are helping to with the, um, as I said, with the communication between the cells to try and almost juice up the brain a little to kick start it or, you know, if you, you hit the side of the toaster to try and get it to start working again, that's, that's mm -hmm. what those, um, those drugs are trying, trying to do. The ones that are in clinical trials that are really exciting now is to try and prevent the disease from actually happening or stop it in its tracks. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's where we are there. Great, okay. Uh, and then Laura, this, so this question I'd like to get your perspective on. Um, we had someone write in and said that bathing is a prevalent problem with Alzheimer's clients or patients. Uh, do you have any suggestions on how to encourage bathing? I know that that can be a struggle for a lot of family caregivers and professionals, maybe in a facility setting or if they're caring for someone in the home. So Laura, any tips on bathing? That is a struggle. And I don't know if it's because there's so many steps involved that it, it's overwhelming to them, but um, I have found that that, it, that is an issue. Um, and you just have to keep encouraging. You know, that's what I do. I just, you know, I will take them into the bathroom. You know, some people can do it themselves. They just need, you know, a little help verbally. Um, and others I've had that, at, you know, can't do it themselves, and I have to literally give them a shower. Um, but it's just taking them in there and going it over step by step. Here's your soap. Here's your shampoo. Now I need you to, you know, get undressed. I need you to get in the shower. I mean, it's just a lot of verbal cueing. Um, and it's, you know, distracting them. You know, they may be focused on not taking a shower. So you have to, you know, walk them in there and tell them, you know, we're going to get in the shower. I'm going to get you in the shower. We're going to get you all cleaned up. Um, so it's just a lot of talking, verbal cues. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And, and I don't know why it is that that seems to be a common theme among them, but it, it's a very common theme. Those are some great suggestions. Diane, did you have any thoughts on that as well? Yeah, so Lakeland, what I wanted to do before we, we kind of move away from the medication and, and how, how oh, yeah. you know, we, you know, we as, uh, you know, as mm -hmm. caregivers, um, you know, paid caregivers, family caregivers, professionals can help them. I know that um, for people with who have dementia in particular, but for people, you know, um, of all ages, falls are a really, really big um, issue. Um, if you, you know, fall and break your hip, then that can kind of start the snowball of he health issues. And so I think one, one thing that, you know, we can do is if we notice that the house is really cluttered or there's things that are all over the ground, you know, you can try and help or, 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 or if you can't pick them up yourself, then you would indicate to the family, like, we really need to declutter the house to, to reduce the risk of falls. Getting back to the medication, I think also another thing is to help monitor, um, A, whether someone is taking the medication the right amount when they should be, but also that um, a lot of um, people, you know, as we get older, we might be taking more and more medications. And so um, it might be good um, to just maybe monitor the medications that people are taking. And there actually are a lot of combinations. So. Um, so we were talking about the Alzheimer's uh, drugs before, but also some people might have antidepressants as well, because there are some people, you know, if you have Alzheimer's, you might be depressed, um, you might have a lot of other symptoms that they'll be giving you both the Alzheimer's, uh, a person, both the Alzheimer's drug and the antidepressants. And it's very important to keep an eye out for potential, potential drug interactions, especially if they have diabetes and low blood pressure, then that's four drugs that they're on. And there may be, um, maybe someone is starting to have behavioral issues because their doctor just started them on a new drug and it's interacting with something else they're taking. So that's just something to just keep an eye on that. And you can, 
uh, really be a champion for the person you're taking care of. That's a great point, Diane. Medication management is a struggle for all older, older adults with or without uh, any sort of cognitive impairment. So that's great that you bring up those specific uh, those specifics when it comes to Alzheimer's and dementia and um, some great great advice offered up there and we had somebody write in Lisa said that when it comes to you know bathing sometimes she finds success with music uh, she uses that as kind of an asset during you know sometimes when uh, the individuals may be getting agitated or upset and that that could be another suggestion for for bath time or bathing situations so thank you for that tip there Lisa um, and then we did have a couple of questions that came in. I'm going to kind of paraphrase them since they all kind of asked something similar. You know, what what age should someone be tested uh, before the illness or dementia is upon them? And then um, also, you know, how soon can someone get a screening done? Uh, and do they have to display certain symptoms before getting screened. So Diane, can you speak a little bit to the screening process? You know, is is it really is there really ever an age that's too soon to get screened? Uh, or is it best to wait until families see signs and symptoms? Yeah, I, I think that um of course I'm not a medical doctor. <laughs> I'm a PhD but not a medical doctor, but I'm just basing this on on on, on my knowledge and talking to other um, professionals. And um, I think that a lot of doctors take a cue from the person themselves who says they have a memory issue. Um, and it's more than just forgetting where I put my keys. I mean, that's, that's, not, that's not Alzheimer's or, um, um, or, or any other type of related dementia. Um, and I think the big thing for a doctor, um, and you know, this is something that you can notice both the caregiver, a paid caregiver, and the family member, um, maybe the paired caregiver, caregiver who knows that person for a long time, but especially the family member says, mom or dad just isn't right, or my wife or husband is just totally different. And so at that point, um, my understanding is that they would try kind of like a, a cognitive test, um, just like a written test or ask a couple of questions and based on a number, a lot of times they'll call it the, the MMSE, um, it's just one, but there's a number of other types of tests. And based on that, then I would say that um, that's not the point for a doctor to be, you know, prescribing any drugs or making any diagnoses. I definitely think that, um, then it would be the time to uh, refer someone to a, a professional like a gerontologist or a neurologist or someone who has specialty in dementia to find out, A, is this Alzheimer's? Is it Lewy body dementia? Is it vascular dementia? Is it Parkinson's dementia? There's many different types of dementia and you wouldn't want to have an Alzheimer's drug for, for any of those. So, um, and how soon? I mean, some people um, do have, um, you know, in their family, uh, early stage uh, forms of um, Alzheimer's that can start in your 40s. Um, but that, you know, you would probably know that because there would be a genetic um, link in your family. Um, but most of the time it would be after 65. Um, but I would, I would say the most important thing is just if, if the person knows that that there's something that there's something different than than just reach out for help. And as you said earlier, there is that um, now the billable uh, cognitive um, discussion that a, that a doctor can have at, at the annual visit. Yes, and I just wanted to verify what that was called. I think we had a question about that. And it's just part of the Medicare annual wellness visit. So if you are going to kind of your general practitioner, you can request a cognitive screening as part of that annual uh, Medicare wellness visit. And your physician should know what you're talking about. So Dan, those are some great, great tips there. And I've also heard from other professionals that, you know, a good place to start is that primary care physician. And, you know, they're often going to refer on to, you know, maybe there's a geriatric clinic in, in the community that does a full uh, in-depth screening that can really dive deeper into that, um, or a geriatrician or a neurologist in the community that can do more more of a comprehensive screening. But if, if 
you know, and likely uh, older adults are comfortable with their primary care physicians because they've been seeing them for quite some time. So that, again, might just be a good place to start for that familiarity factor uh, as well. So uh, great suggestions there. Um, and then, Diane, I think you might have touched on this earlier, um, but forgive me if, if, you, if you did, but um, have you heard of any correlation with blood pressure medications or antacid medications with dementia? Is there any, uh, we had someone write in asking about that correlation. Is, have you come across any scientific research specifically in that regard? Yeah, I think that um, there were um, some studies done for anti-cholesterol drugs, I think statins, um, there are people on both sides thinking, oh, does it increase your risk, lower risk? Um, I, I'm not quite sure about any of the evidence for antacids, but I know with um, some blood pressure medications, it's like I was mentioning earlier, some of them can interact if you're taking a certain type of sleeping pill. So blood pressure med, there is a, and, 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 you know, professionals or actually even you can go to it, you know, as a caregiver or, or, you know, even the person themselves, you can go look in the nurse's drug handbook and, and some of these interactions are listed in there. It's like, I'm taking this and this drug and you can, you can go and look in there, but definitely go to the doctor. Um, uh, so, yeah, so there are some um, interactions between the one that I was talking about. That would be one of those cases where that apparent dementia could be reversible. You just stop taking those drugs together and then um, a lot of times someone will, will, will um, get, get a little better. So that, that wouldn't be, you know, a, a diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's, but it's all in the whole differential diagnosis, as they say, process. Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. Sometimes there can be adverse drug interactions that can bring on you know, cognitive issues, or you know, uh, what's common among older adults are urinary tract infections, which can bring on, you know, symptoms of Alzheimer's or dementia or cognitive impairment. And so what I like to tell families is if the, the cognition issues come on all of a sudden, then it could be, you know, a medication issue, or maybe they have a UTI if they have a history of it, uh, because we often see, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dan, but kind of more of a progression of symptoms with Alzheimer's or dementia. So it's not not like all overnight they're going to turn into an entirely different person. Usually you'll start to notice those little memory issues along the way. Um, so, yeah, we definitely want to make yeah, sure absolutely. that yeah. we're having those meds reconciled for for our patients or the people that we're caring for. So that's a great, great question. Um, we have some more coming in, so feel free to type in your um, questions as we go along. Um, somebody asked also, is Alzheimer's hereditary? And I know that you touched a little bit, Diane, on that topic, um, but would you mind speaking a little bit more? Because I know that there might be one particular gene I've heard that uh, could increase your risk, uh, but would you mind speaking to the hereditary factors, if any, of Alzheimer's disease? Yeah, I think that the the short answer is that there are some genetic um, risk factors that have been found, um, but there are still some that that haven't been found, and and we and other organizations are trying to find the link. So there's, as I was saying, there's kind of two different onsets of Alzheimer's. There's the early onset and the late onset. And most people who get the disease over 65, they're, um, they haven't really found um, a, like a, a, a big genetic link yet with that, other than um, there's a gene called APOE4. And all that is, is it's a it's a gene in your body that normally helps the process or move cholesterol. And um, it just happens to be associated with, with a higher risk. Um, and, um, and for, but the definite, there's three definite genes that are linked with early onset. And those are the um, diseases that can start, you know, manifest in their forties and fifties. And those involve, um, presenilin-1, presenilin-2, and APP genes. And uh, those are all genes involved with um, this, you know, beta amyloid protein that I was talking about that kind of accelerates the, 
the deposit and, and, and the spread um, of that protein in the brain. Thank you. That, that's all good information to know. So the, the chances of somebody having a hereditary form of Alzheimer's seems somewhat rare. Is that, is that what I'm getting from that explanation? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's why we're funding a lot of research. A lot of people really don't know how, how Alzheimer's starts. Um, so, but yes, it's right now, um, the, the genetic links are really um, strongly determined um, in the early onset Alzheimer's. Um, and, you know, the closest thing, there are a number of genes that are candidates. Um, however, yeah, there's only one, one gene, the APOE4, that, that tends to uh, be associated with higher risk. Um, yeah, so I think that um, it's, 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 it's disappointing. I can't give you a definitive answer that, yes, <laughs> we, we found, <laughs> you know, but that, that's why, you know, we yeah. and, and we're funding researchers very um, driven, uh, passionate people to try and find out um, an answer as soon as possible. Yes, well, we do know that age is probably the biggest risk factor. I think that's probably something that everyone is starting to yeah. agree upon. <laughs> but beyond that, the jury is still out. But that's great that you guys are funding this research. And uh, so many researchers out there are working tirelessly to find the cause so that we can find a cure and find more drugs that can help with the symptoms of Alzheimer's because it can be such an emotional roller coaster for families, for those living with the disease. Um, and Laura, I had a question for you. As a professional caregiver, you probably also interact quite a bit with the families and you probably see this emotional roller coaster that's taking place and see the emotional toll that it takes on the family. Uh, how do you go about supporting uh, family caregivers through this journey? Um, can you speak a little bit to your experience on that, Laura? And I think we're still having a little trouble hearing, so if you could speak up a little more, that'd be most helpful. Okay. Um, yeah, you really need to be there to support the family. Uh, the family has a lot of questions. Um, their loved one is not the same person that they remember. I mean, it, they're a different person now. Um, so the family does need a lot of support. So I'm just there to, to you know, help guide them through it to, you know, answer questions if I can, or direct them to resources, if I can direct them to resources. Um, it's, it's a really tough time. I, I remember, you know, I'll speak again to my dad. My mother had a really hard time. I mean, that, that was not the man she married. That was, you know, she would tell him to go and sweep the sidewalk and he'd come back carrying a shovel. I mean, he had no idea how to, and she would get extremely frustrated with him. So, you know, I really had to work a lot with her on patience. You know, you just have to understand he's not going to remember how to sweep. You have to go out there, give him the broom, show him how to sweep, and then he can do it. Um, so, you know, it's a lot of working with the families because it is very frustrating, very hard on them. Um, so patience, patience is key. Um, and, you know, verbal cueing is key. And so they need to learn how to verbal cue and how to you know, find what their loved one was passionate about when they were younger. Um, so, you know, like I say, with with my dad and with another one of my clients too, music was huge. I had another client that um, his wife said that he, you know, used to like Frank Sinatra. But if you asked him who Frank Sinatra was, he had no clue. He'd never heard of Frank Sinatra. But once I started mm -hmm. playing the music, he could tell me about all the concerts he went to. He could sing all the words to the songs. Um, so, you know, music music is huge. And also I tell um, families another great thing to do that we found is we made a photo book for my dad. Um, and he mm -hmm. carried that book with him everywhere. And that helped him remember who his family was. It helped him remember certain times in his life, you know, through pictures. You know, we had all the pictures captioned with dates. Um, and so that really helped him stay connected. If a family member was coming over that he hadn't seen in a while, he could look in his book and we would go over it. Or, you know, my mother would go over it with him. You know, this, this is who's coming. Um, so he wouldn't feel so confused and so frustrated that he couldn't remember. Um, so th those are a couple. Mu music and the photo books were, were huge helps in our family. Well, 
Laura, this is Diane. Isn't it? Um, I think it's true that uh, people who are care caring for uh, individuals with dementia are at increased risk for, you know, getting, you know, depression and ill themselves. Is there anything that, you know, you do or you recommend other people can do um, to, to help spot that or, or help help the family member? Well, um, I'll, I'll go back to my dad again. Like, my mother is very socially active. She's very with it. Um, so my dad was at the point that he needed somebody with him 24-7. He, he needed monitoring all the time. Well, that was very difficult for my mother, you know, and I was there most every day. But on occasion when I couldn't be there, we found, um, I'll call it an, a, a, through, a, through a senior center, I'll call it adult daycare. Um, and so we could take my dad over there, and he actually loved going over there. I mean, there was lots of socialization. They did crafts. They sang songs. Um, he really liked that, and that would give my mother, you know, she could take him over there for two or three hours and, you know, get a nice long break to do whatever it was that she needed to do if I wasn't available. So um, that's another good resource. If you have some kind of senior center in your town or where you live that has some type of uh, program for Alzheimer's dementia patients where you can drop them off and um, they're cared for. Those are some great suggestions today, and you make a great point. Yeah, we it's so important for the caregiver themselves to take care uh, to take care of themselves so that they can better take care of their loved one. On on our family caregiver webinar we did a couple hours ago, uh, our expert shared a great example, which um, I is going to stick with me for the rest of my life. She said, um, you know, when you go on an airplane and you're sitting down and they're going through all the safety uh, instructions, and they say, you know. Uh, if the air mask drops from the ceiling, put your mask on before assisting a child or an, uh, somebody that can't uh, administer their own mask. We have to apply that same thing when we are family caregivers because you need to take care of yourself. You need to put your own mask on first. Make sure that you're uh, able to s provide that assistance to the person you're caring for. Um, I thought that, that that visual image just really hit me, um, and I will forever remember that. So, yes, that's a great point because, you know, if, if the older adult uh, that's needing care, if their caregiver doesn't have the health themselves uh, to assist, then they, um, not only the caregiver is at risk for maybe hospitalization or in some cases, they end up dying before their loved one because they're just not taking care of themselves. We need to focus on the caregiver um, and make sure that their care needs are met, especially um, as professionals. We need to kind of recognize when we're seeing someone with caregiver burnout and provide them with resources. And this was the perfect cue to move on to our resources slide because we have lots of great resources that we've covered today. Uh, and we have some of them listed here on the slide. I know Diane talked a lot about the work Bright Focus is doing. Uh, so you can certainly visit that site to learn about their clinical trials and the research studies they have going on. If you want to participate or know someone who wants to participate in the clinical trials, at the very bottom there's clinicaltrials.gov where you can uh, search for trials that might, you might qualify for. And I mentioned that missing senior network site. There it is there for you. And caregiverstress.com, again, ties in beautifully to our conversation about making sure that caregivers are taking care of themselves and their stress level so that they can be better prepared to care for their uh, loved one with Alzheimer's or dementia. But I just want to thank you all so much for tuning in today. And remember that we will be sending out this recording along with any resources that aren't listed on, on the slide that we've been talking about. Uh, and Diane and Laura, I just want to thank you so much for spending time and your expertise with us. We're so grateful for all the great insight and resources you shared with us today. Oh, great. Thank you. And, and, and thank you to everyone who's listening, who's really on the front line. Yep. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. Well, um, there's additional opportunities to participate in our Alzheimer's Learning Day, so I encourage you to visit alzlearn.com where you can learn, educate, and share. Uh, so if you have any great tidbits or takeaways from today's discussion, please uh, share it on your social media with the hashtag alzlearningday. 
2017. Um, again, visit that site. We'll have the recording posted there, and we'll be sending you the recording via email so you can share it with other colleagues that might have missed it or family or friends that you think might benefit from all of this wonderful information. Again, thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks to our experts. Uh, thanks to our sponsor, Home Instead Senior Care. Uh, and I hope you all have a great, wonderful day. Take care. Bye.